Welcome to the Business in Colour podcast with Div and Satna. We are women of colour. Our passion is diversity and we thrive on conversations leading to action. So we decided to bring you these discussions with culturally diverse leaders and allies who share their stories and their journey to a more diverse workplace. They speak from the heart. They are leaders who are committed to making a difference. These stories will inspire you to lead your own conversations and spark action on diversity in business and in your life. If you enjoy listening to the Business in Colour podcast, please leave us a review and share with your tribe. Conversation today is with Scott Tanner, who is the ex-CEO of the Bank of Melbourne, a strong ally, and he walks the talk when it comes to diversity. I've had the pleasure of working with Scott when he was the CEO of Bank of Melbourne, when he asked me in to speak to his management team about my journey. During his time at the Bank of Melbourne, Scott successfully set up a multicultural program that is still in place today. He has always been focused on the voice of the customer and that it must be heard by decision makers. And one of the ways to do this successfully is to ensure that your leaders are diverse because of course your customers are too. What set the Bank of Melbourne apart as a local bank was their goal to ensure that their customers achieved their dreams. And leaders needed to advocate for their customers internally. And if they were successful at this, those same customers would advocate for them externally. What a wonderful philosophy to have in an organization. Scott talks about how there was only four people between him and the customer at any one time. And that in many large organizations, we know that the scale and complexity they operate in may not enable this to happen. The passion for diversity that Scott has stems from working with people of all backgrounds where the stale pale male does not have the monopoly. He understands that diversity is how you get talent and scale yourself as an organization. And as you increase the diversity of talent, you will start to get good cultural change. Diversity is a philosophy, words from a leader that all of us from culturally diverse backgrounds want to hear, and a philosophy that leaders globally should work towards. Please enjoy our conversation with Scott Tanner. Well, hello and welcome to Business in Colour with Div and Sartner. Uh, before we start, we would all like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to leaders past, present and emerging. Now, our guest today, very excited to welcome him, is Scott Tanner, who is currently the Chairman of uh, chairman of Committee for Melbourne and Director of Melbourne Business School. And one of his previous roles was as CEO for Bank of Melbourne, where he built a really strong, dedicated team to Victoria um, and to the Victorian business, but also had a, a, a huge hand in the multicultural part of the business as well. Scott, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sadna. Thank you, Div. Pleased to meet you. So I want to I want to start by maybe Scott and you know very few people in Melbourne who wouldn't know you, but for those of our listeners who are either overseas or interstate, maybe if you started with a, a bit of a background, you know, highlights of your career up till today. Uh, sure. I, I started uh, actually I, I had an applied science mathematics degree is how I started and I went into engineering. So my first job was actually as a computer engineer for uh, a very large uh, mainframe computer company who's you know probably producing computers of the power that are now in the palm of your hand. So uh, it was a very different world uh, back then. And uh, But what I did learn out of that is I learned how computers work. Uh, I learned a lot about project management and my job was uh, taking the machines through QA and bringing them down into Australia and installing them and then looking after them. So I did a lot of problem solving. So I think that set me up. Um, I joined a bank uh, in the very early days of banking uh, or electronic banking, banking communications as it was. Um, uh, very, very early days in ATMs, FPOS, telephone banking. Uh, I uh, managed tre treasury trading systems. I installed, I think, the second private optical fibre in, uh, in at, at that time, um, and uh, I did an MBA, and uh, then went into mainstream banking. And uh, from mainstream banking, I was doing a lot of work in the in what I call the strategy planning, research, analysis uh, space, and I was picked up by a global strategy consulting firm to help build 
um, their business in Australia uh, and uh, in particular with a focus on uh, financial services. So I, built, I helped uh, build the practice uh, here. I helped build the practice in South Africa and across Asia PAC. And uh, so I was very lucky, very fortunate. Uh, and then um, I uh, ended up uh, uh, running the, the Asia Pacific uh, financial services practice for, uh, for several years. So um, uh, very lucky. And then I, I joined Westpac and, uh, to relaunch the Bank of Melbourne. And that's where you and I met when you um, asked me to speak at the multicultural program that you had started at the Bank of Melbourne. Um, it wasn't a question I asked you at the time, but I'm looking forward to your answer this time when I ask you the question is what? You know, and, and that was a number of years ago, right? That would have been about seven years ago, Scott, eight years ago, maybe? Yeah, the Bank of Melbourne was relaunched in 2010. 10. Uh, so 2010. That's and uh, the multicultural program was an important part of that. Um, we, we elevated that up to make sure that we had a steering group, a multicultural steering group uh, as well. But um, for the very essence of what the bank was, being a local bank, was that it needed to be close to its customers. Uh, Melbourne is a very culturally diverse uh, marketplace. And so it was um, terribly important that we actually recruited people who understood the language and, and cultural uh, dimensions of the local community um, in, in, in my view. Beautiful and visionary, really. Um, Scott, I'm interested to find out whether you had any pushback to your decision to kick this off from the rest of the Westpac group. Can you say? Can't you say? Um, it would it'd be wonderful to hear how you just brought this vision to life and, and what happened to you as a leader. Did you get asked questions, that sort of thing? Um, look, I think the, uh, it depends on the, the sort of pushback you're talking about. I mean, relaunching the Bank of Melbourne itself was a, you know, a very interesting uh, uh, journey. We, were, um, uh, we just completed the merger integration of St George uh, into the Westpac group. Um, uh, I had to, uh, as part of that process, convince the executive team and the board that um, uh, growing in Victoria uh, and rebranding uh, the St George business in Victoria was actually the right thing to do. Uh, that investing a lot of money behind that program was actually the right thing to do because there was a big growth opportunity in Victoria for the group. And um, an important part of, 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 I suppose, what we researched and what we knew uh, was that um, Victoria is a very different market. And if we were going to succeed in Victoria, we needed to... Um, recruit people uh, who were reflective of the market that we we're going to operate in. Um, so there was pushback around, you know, uh, you can appreciate with uh, 2010, that was only three years after the GFC. Um, there was, uh, you know, some pushback about, you know, launching at that time, 2010, a, 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 a frankly, a physical branch based distribution model supported by digital, where a lot of, you know, organisations were actually um, going hard at digital or thinking that they could um, be only digital. Um, mm. But I, I wasn't in that camp. I believe that you needed the combination of a trusted um, relationship with customers at the local level. You needed to engage with the community. I believe that in a globalising world, um, people seek local. Um, there's, a, there's a certain comfort in that if you can do it the right way. And so uh, we changed the branches so that they were designed for interaction rather than transaction, and, um, because people didn't need to do transactions in the branches. But if they're going to interact with somebody in the branch, they needed to interact with somebody that they felt comfortable with. And, and that was part of, uh, part of what we, uh, we focused on. I, I recruited non-bankers, um, which was uh, for, for those customer service roles, um, because uh, I didn't feel that people from the banking industry, you know, from our competitors, our major competitors in particular, would be comfortable actually getting out from behind um, the screens that they're operating in and then um, uh, interacting with customers in an open footprint branch. Uh, I'd seen this model overseas and I felt that that was, uh, that was going to be a much more compelling way to actually engage with customers. And so, uh, mm -hmm. so there's a bunch of things like that that came together. That was new. Uh, so, you know, obviously relaunching the brand was new, but, but mm -hmm. the model that we chose to use was new. Mm -hmm. uh, the cultural program, probably not so resistive, actually, in terms of the focus that we needed to have, uh, in truth. All of the major banks had um, 
cultural, multicultural programs, uh, but I just think they struggle to maintain a focus on it. I think they struggle to deliver it. Mm. What do you think was the main struggle that they had? If you Would you know, reflecting on it now? Yeah. I do, I, I, because I worked on the multicultural uh, strategy for the for the group. Um, the, the the big struggle, I think, for major organisations or large organisations is that the scale that they operate at, and um, and, and they they use the cost lever a lot. Complexity mm -hmm. is actually um, uh, their biggest enemy in a way, and so they average. That, you know, I'm I'm big, I'm large, so I'm going to average, and uh, many of them struggle to have a nuanced approach to I can I can deal with this market differently than that market can deal with that market differently. Mm -hmm. The multi-brand model gave us the you know that that we developed at the Westpac Group gave us flexibility to do that, and I had the ability, um, uh, fortunately, within the Bank of Melbourne to actually um, make the decisions locally. So. Mm -hmm. I think we were closer to the customer. There were four people between myself and a customer, maximum, uh, at all times. And and I think when you get into very large banks, that's that's not that's not true. Yeah, but the decision making doesn't um, doesn't get made that close to the customer, and it's hard to sustain. Mm. But it's such a good um, decision making model, really, because the closer you are the quicker you can make those decisions, the more insights you can have. Um, and I think now when I think about the other banks and their models, you're quite right that there's there's such a big distance between um, it, it, you know, leaders in that model. But also I find that there's um, not a lot of governance around like who looks after the customer. Um, they're quite disparate mm -hmm. across the bank and they, and multicultural programs in other companies that I've seen has been quite, um, you know, siloed in the business. So um, sounds like you actually got it quite understood and embedded across the Westpac group. Would you say that that people didn't see this as a as a corner little program that you were running and and people understood it? Yeah, I, I was very focused on the voice of the customer and making mm. sure the voice of the customer was heard um, by decision makers uh, in, in, you know, myself in particular, but my team. Um, and and so how do you how do you ensure you do that in a market that's culturally diverse? I mean, you need leaders who are culturally diverse or at least empathetic to that cultural diversity and and can see the value that, you know, the purpose of being a local bank was to, you know, to frankly, to ensure that everybody could achieve their dreams. Mm. So you need to understand those dreams, you need to understand those aspirations and, 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 um, and be prepared to advocate for them internally, uh, mm. as well as um, in, you know, try and um, deliver a service that the customers advocate for you out in the marketplace. And, and so that was, that was sort of how we approached it. Mm. Oh, Scott, come back and lead a bank. I know. Do that, like, oh. Intriguing that, you know, clearly it was a really successful program. Customers' engagement, your employee engagement would have been through the roof. Um, was there a time when your counterparts, well, were you ever able to influence your counterparts in any way, shape or form? I mean, were there questions asked, were there discussions had? It intrigues me that even Westpac didn't pick up that type of model and run with it. Yeah, look, it, it, it's I've got to be careful about uh, speaking on behalf of, of Westpac, but but the the um, what we believed and, and the, within the multi brand model, maybe it's it's important to understand that, that you've got the Westpac Group, which is a national brand, and then you've got a series of local brands that were being run at the time in a separate group um, under a multi brand uh, leader. Um, the the, the, the idea was that we could deliver, we, we had the scale and the reach, we had the products and the service, we, we had the pricing power of the major bank. What we needed to do to differentiate ourselves was actually to be close to the customer and close to the community. Um, so Bank of Melbourne was part of the St George uh, banking group. So, so the St George brand, the Rams brand and the Bank of South Australia brand. Um, and what, what we're, I, I, so my answer to your question is, I think we were able to influence what happened in that group um, with a customer um, uh, service promise program. 
Uh, so basically saying, look, the, the, the market's largely equivalent in, in many respects. So how are we going to differentiate ourselves? We're going to differentiate ourselves culturally. Um, and, uh, and the way that we deliver that extraordinary customer experience has got to be through delivering a service promise. So we started a service promise program within uh, the multi-brand model. That actually ended up being picked up within the entire group not just in the retail and business brands, but in the wealth management business, in the corporate and institutional banking business, it was advocated from the top um, after they saw the sort of impact it was having um, with customers and, and with staff, as you said, um, within, the, mm. within the, 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 the regional or um, local brands. Mm. What do you think? I mean, it, it, the model that you ran—it was, you know, to, to talking about 2010, so you know, nearly 10 years ago, and it, and it's it's still running now. I mean, I now sit on the diversity council at Bank of Melbourne. I don't know whether you knew that or not, but so it's it's been really wonderful to stay connected to the organisation. But it, I wonder what your thoughts are on why do you think leaders in large organisations at the moment uh, across the country. Um, are not embracing diversity at the levels and the pace that they need to do it at? That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> that's a big question for me to answer. I, I, I'm not sure it's possible to have a general answer to that question. Well, um, I, I, th I can answer the question of why was I passionate about diversity? Um, I'm not sure I can answer why others aren't passionate about diversity, but um, you know, I came through a, um, an organisation that was a global organisation that was a meritocracy in, in, in the global consulting firm that I worked with. Uh, and um, so we were, uh, and, and because I was heading the financial services practice in Asia Pacific, I, I was exposed to extraordinarily talented people from all walks of life, from all ethnicities and all backgrounds. And so maybe that made me um, more likely to believe in, you know, that, that the, I suppose, the pale and stale, uh, you know, Western uh, white male uh, didn't have a monopoly on intelligence, didn't have a, a monopoly on the ability to do extraordinary things that you could see were happening in other parts of the world. And, and so I suppose... The, you know, I've always been an advocate for diversity because that's how you're going to get talent. Um, um, that's how you're going to scale yourself. If you're just limiting yourself to not even 50% of the market, but, you know, a small proportion of the 50% of the market, you, you can't succeed. I mean, I, I just don't see how you could think that you're going to succeed. So if you, if you take that view that it's talent-based, then you need to grow that talent into leadership, they're gonna create great engagement. And then what you've got is you've got a cultural change that occurs in the organization. And so I think that, um, uh, that you know, for some people, I'm sure that's frightening. For some people, it's, it's not um, something that they think about, but it is something that I thought about. And I, you know, it was central to our strategy and it was central to the way that I thought about business. So I, that was something that I was quite passionate about ensuring that we advocated. Mm -hmm. Scott, I'm curious to ask, have you ever challenged another senior male leader about their decisions hiring talent or promoting talent? Um, because I think what would be really powerful is if we, if we had more senior leaders like yourselves just challenging other senior leaders on their decision making with talent. I have, uh, I have, and um, you, you've got to do it the right way. Uh, I mean, not, honestly, you can you can create the wrong outcome. Um, mm. You you know, I'm a big believer in you can't change people's minds. That sounds strange. Let me explain. Um, as human beings, we need to change our own minds, and so the best that we can do is either demonstrate or question um, what's doing. We can't. You know, yes, if you're the boss, you can tell somebody to do something and, and, and hopefully they do it the way that you hope they're going to do it. But my point more generally with peers is you can't, you can't tell somebody what to do uh, if they're your peer or, or they're your superior. So, and that's really the level of influence that you need to have. So uh, in many respects, you need to get people to reflect on what they're doing, either by showing them there's a better way to do it or by asking questions about what they're doing. Because mm -hmm. I find... Um... Australian leaders really either need a business case 
for diversity or they need, um, they appeal to the empathy side of things. So they either actually innately feel it's the right thing to do and don't need a business case or they actually need some um, hard line numbers to show them that diversity and inclusion will lead to growth and innovation and all those good things. Um, so do you agree? But, you know, it's one or the other. The, the business case is, is compelling. I mean, if you, if you took the time to look at the business case, the business case is compelling. Um, but you think about what, what that means in Australia. There's a group of people who migrated from the relative um, uh, comfort, I'm mean, saying culturally comfortable environment that they lived in. It may not have been safe. That may be the reason. It may not have provided the right opportunities, but it was a big step to come to Australia. It's a long distance to come. Um, and uh, they've embraced that and they're trying to make a life here. I mean, that's extraordinary. Most people, you know, um, don't do that, right? Most people don't do that. And somebody who does do that is special. Um, then you look at the talent that comes through out of that sort of first generation um, or that, you know, the first generation after migration and the, the um, work ethic and passion that many of them have for um, education or for excellence in, in whatever field is extraordinary. And, you know, that, that's defined Australia. So Australia, in a way, is a huge beneficiary from, from that over many decades. And so you know, I, think, I think the business case is, is pretty obvious. On average, um, the multicultural customer is more valuable to a bank, as it turns out, um, than, than the average Australian. Uh, and so the, I, to me, the business case is obvious. Uh, you just you pursue it every time. Mm. So in your current role as chairman of committee for Melbourne, are you able to still influence business leaders, not just in Melbourne, but across the country on, you know, your, uh, your view on, on, on diversity? Oh, whenever I can. I mean, I, I, I've been involved in numerous boards over the years. I, I, uh, um, I still, uh, I chair a public company uh, um, as well as uh, the committee for Melbourne and I, I sit on the board of Melbourne Business School, as you said earlier, and I've been on several other boards. Um, I also sit on the Bank of Melbourne Foundation uh, advisory board. So there are, there are many opportunities to, uh, to influence um, leaders, uh, you know, but I, I do believe by demonstration and by decision making, you, you do that. And, mm. and, and just the way that you think about diversity and the importance of diversity, um, you know, make sure that I've got the right um, age diversity on the, on the oh. Committee for Melbourne Board, for instance. Um, we've got some, you know, we've got enough ethnic diversity, but also background diversity. I mean, we talk about diversity. To me, you make better decisions if you've got more diverse thinking around that table. And if it's the, you know, it's the right level of thinking, that's a powerful combination. Um, mm. You can look at problems from very different angles and, uh, and come up with a much better answer, um, I believe. I think you're, the, you're one of the first guests that we've had that, you know, from your perspective, you just made it all sound so simple. And it, and it actually is quite simple. You know, you, you don't need a plan, you don't need a business case. It's just doing the right thing at the end of the day, isn't it? From a, from a employee and business. Yeah, it, look, it's a philosophy, isn't it? I mean, I think it's a way of thinking about the world. I mean, uh, you, you know, we're talking about the community. It's either your market or it's your, you know, supply of employees. I mean, um, if you want the right supply of talent and you want the right, you know, customer engagement, I, I, I don't know how else you can do it, except you've got to have um, be right minded about how you go about those sort of things. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question, Scott, about inclusion? We've talked a lot about diversity and I'll, I'll give you a, a bit of a practical sense of some of the, the women that we coach who come from a diverse background who are sitting probably in the middle to senior levels in organizations. And, and for many of them, they are the first females of color in those teams. Um, if you had to think about um, how we change those environments to be more inclusive, because what we do hear from these women is that they often um, don't have a voice. Uh, their voices are often drowned out. Um, so you do miss out on the diversity because 
they're not really truly included. They're there, they're represented, they're hired, um, they're sitting in there. Uh, some of it has to do with internal agency and they've got to actually put themselves out there and, you know, um, voice their ideas and challenge people and thinking. And so, yes, some of it is, is self-imposed uh, barriers if they're not doing it. Uh, but some of these women report trying and trying and then getting knocked down and knocked down. Um, and, you know, over a long period of time, they lose their voices. So what can you, uh, advice can you give to leaders who do have first people of color, first older people, first younger people, all that rich diversity that we hire in, what are, what are some of the advice that you can give to senior leaders to really lead more inclusively in the moment? What have you done? Well, I'm sad to hear that, um, that in a way that that's still, still the experience. Um, uh, it, I mean, I, th I think as a leader, you've got to get to know your team. You've got to, uh, um, in, in order to lead, you're, uh, you're not telling them what to do. You're creating an environment in which they can be um, as successful as they possibly can be. And, and there was always an, an acid test in, uh, in my consulting career, which is uh, who had actually extracted, um, or it's probably the wrong word, but anyway, had engaged and actually gotten um, maximum performance out of somebody who was actually struggling in another environment. And the person who gotten them to achieve their full potential was a better leader um, because they could have been, you know, unsuccessful in this team, unsuccessful in that team, and then put with a different leader who approached things differently and suddenly they were a superstar mm -hmm. and, and their trajectory changed. Um, but what happened to that individual was, you know, truly inspiring if mm -hmm. you can tap into that, uh, that full potential. Not everybody's born the same, not everybody has the same, uh, as you said, the same confidence to put those points of view out. But, uh, but if you can create the right environment, it can nurture that, you know, we're, as, as leaders, that, that's actually caring uh, for that individual, understanding them, being empathetic with uh, with what they're doing and, and trying to help them achieve their full potential. If they do, your job's a lot easier. You've got much more leverage as a leader if you've got great people fully engaged who are doing a great job. Um, uh, so I don't see why uh, that wouldn't be widely understood. I mean, I, I, I think if you can get the most out of your team, then that's a that's a better outcome for everybody because everybody lifts and everybody benefits. Mm. You mentioned a key element there, which is empathy. Um, and I think that's missing in business today, that humanistic, empathetic approach. Um, because I think if we start from there, then everyone should be respected and connected in that team enough to hear them out. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, very important missing leadership skill set, empathy. Mm. Thanks, Scott, for reminding us. Do you, do you think COVID is going to change that though? It's interesting. Um, I agree. I think that that is missing, but I wonder if the experiences that we've all had where leaders have been able to have a peek into the lives of their employees because they're all Zooming like we are now and kids turn up and dogs and parrots and all sorts of things turn up these days on Zoom meetings. I just wonder if as we come out of this into next year, whether that's actually going to have an impact on, on that. A great question. I, I, I think we've seen into people's lives a little bit more than which we otherwise would have. Um, you know, you can encourage people to bring all of themselves to work, which is a, an important thing to do. You want, you want people to feel that comfortable, but um, not everybody feels comfortable doing it. Well, in the current environment, we've got this window into uh, people's life at home. Uh, and as you say, dogs, cats and children and and, and the likes um, we, we wouldn't have otherwise seen. So it's been great, I think, to see that. Let's hope we don't forget uh, because that will be the risk. The risk will be we'll get back into it and maybe we'll get back to normal um, in the near future and and we'll forget. Um, but I think it's I think it's a great point. Certainly it's something that everybody that I, uh, you know, I've uh, spoken to talks about just how interesting it is to actually see somebody in their home environment being a little bit more relaxed and and, uh, and a little bit more them, the whole mm. yeah. mm. Well, Dave and I usually have a, um, a call out at the end of our uh, podcast. 
and um, Div, I'll, I'll go to you first and then I'll go to Scott and I'll do mine last. What, what's from today's what you've heard? What, what's your call out to leaders, business leaders? Oh, I'm going to go with Scott. So I'm going to steal his empathy um, reminder today and go with empathetic leadership. Um, and just to follow on from our last uh, bit of our conversation that I think while the pandemic has really taught us to be more connected, um, unfortunately, the stats are showing that there's an increase in mental health problems, women especially a lot more isolated, ethnically and culturally diverse women suffering more so from the isolation from family members who are still overseas in developing countries who are uh, facing the pandemic worse than Australia. So there's a lot of um, social cultural uh, issues and, and different dis disadvantaged communities that were pre-pandemic quite vulnerable that are that the pandemic has made more vulnerable. Um, so I'd, I'd like us to absolutely focus in on the empathy and the connectedness that is positive that has come out of it, but also be in tune to the nuances of which employees are not telling us everything and, and what else do they need? Because I'm um, popping in a, a Lifeline or Beyond Blue or EAP number on a chat is not enough because a lot of communities don't know how to access that kind of support. It's still quite distant kind of levels of support. So I think um, my call out is yes, let's remember empathy, but also remember how different people um, are affected by the pandemic and what they might specifically need. Um, Thanks, Steve. Really, really, really important point, particularly at the moment in, for those of us who are in Melbourne, I think, more than anywhere else. Scott, what about you? Well, I love Div's point. I think it's, um, it's absolutely right. We were talking before you joined Div um, um, uh, about the increase uh, in calls to mental health uh, helplines uh, that's been occurring. Um, I, I suppose the, the call out for me is uh, to try and think about how do we how do we keep that uh, insight, that window into people, the whole of the person um, post uh, post pandemic? I think I think the digital experience that we're having is going to continue um, to a certain extent, but I think we also want to make sure that people come together in teams and uh, uh, in creative industries in particular. That's important that you've got that sort of cross collaboration and energizing um, in close quarters. So to, to, to try and preserve, if you like, that window into the whole person uh, when they're at work going forward, I think is, um, is probably my take out from this conversation. And my, I'm gonna steal one of your lines as well, Scott, and that is that diversity is actually philosophy. Um, it's such a wonderful way to describe that. And I think if we can take it away from KPIs and business models and actually try and create it as a philosophy in an organisation and within leaders, I think we might actually see some significant changes start to happen. It's a wonderful way to, um, to see it. So thank you for your time. I know you're, you're a very busy man and, and thank you for taking the time to talk to um, Div and I. Um, I have enormous amount of respect for you and what you've done and, and how engaged you have been with the diverse sector in, in Melbourne, if not Australia. And I know that um, every one of us who is not white <laughs> and comes from a diverse background need leaders like yourself in organisations to actually create pathways and open doors and, and change how businesses are. So, you know, thank you very much um, for that, Div. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, absolutely, Scott. It's, it's just wonderful to hear how authentic you are, like, you, I really believe you when you say it's your philosophy because it just comes from like a deeper side of you, which I really think that needs to come out more in other leaders. I think, Sadhna, you're right that we get so caught up with the numbers and the business case and actually it is the right thing to do and it's not hard to do it. You know, of all the complex things that we're facing, kindness and empathy isn't difficult uh, to do. Um, so I really echo Sadhana's comments and thank you so much for generously sharing your time and your insights. I think this is gonna be one of the most watched ones uh, that we've had. So thank you so much. Thank you for asking. And until next time, that was Scott Tenner, Viv and Sadhana Smiles in Business in Colour. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Business in Colour. 
We hope it will help you start your own discussions on diversity and inspire you to take action. We would love you to take a moment to let us know what you thought by leaving a rating and a review. The best place to find out more about our work and to connect with us personally is on LinkedIn. Until next time, stay safe and stay connected.